Hallelujah. It's a privilege to be here. You know, um, it's an honor and a privilege to be in the house of the Lord and be with God's people and, and uh, be taught the Word, study the Word. I tell you, there's, there's millions of people. Sometimes we live in a small world, but there's millions of people that do not have the opportunity to do what we're doing today. Millions. That, that kind of blows your mind when you think about it. And be able to, millions of people that can't go, they don't have fresh water, they don't have fresh food, some don't have any food at all. So if you have plenty to eat and a roof over your head, you can keep cool in the summertime, warm in the winter, you can go to your refrigerator and get some ice and get some water, we ought to be thanking God, amen? We ought to be just praising the Lord, mm -hmm. hallelujah. And uh, we take a lot of things for granted. And uh, I know I do, and... Uh, but we need to focus a little bit more on that and giving God praise. Let's go to Romans 12, <clears throat> 1 and 2. We're talking about discovering and experiencing the perfect will of God. Number one, finding out what that is, which is not hard to do because it is His Word. And uh, we need to renew our mind to line up with the Word of God. <clears throat> Can somebody say amen? All right. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, that word we talked about means, it's a strong word, it literally means big, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, that's our part, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service or worship. And a warning, be not conformed to this world. Why does he say that? Because it's so easy to be conformed to this world if you don't do something about it. But be ye transformed by the how? The renewing, and that's ongoing, renewing of your mind that you may prove or you may distinguish or understand and discern what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You'd think that that would be an easy thing, but there are a lot of people confused about what the will of the Lord is. They think everything that happens to them is the will of the Lord, that God has a hand in it. God does not have a hand in everything. They think that God gives permission, God sanctions, God sends. Um, we need to understand that God only thing God sends is good and perfect gifts from above. And, and when we go to the scripture, we know that if it's not good and perfect, it didn't come from God. And we need to do some resisting in that area. So what we're talking about this morning in renewing our mind to the perfect will of God, we'll talk a little bit about the power of praise. And a Wednesday night, the teaching was on having the right perspective, having the right perspective, learning to look at the problems that come into our life in the light of eternity. Uh, not look at them where they're overwhelming us. You know, I've got so many problems. You don't, you don't, I can't even, you uh, begin to tell anybody how many problems. You've heard people sing that song, Nobody Knows the Trouble I've Seen. Well, you know, the truth is we've all seen trouble and there's things that's come in everybody's life. But we need to look at it in light of eternity. And a perspective is a mental view or a point of view. It's the capacity to, review, to view things in their true uh, relations or relative importance. We need to view things of just how important is this when I compare it to eternity. Um, there's a verse I want to go to right to start with, Luke 2 and 1, if we could. <coughs> and then we're going to go to John 14, 1 and 2. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And... I'm going to read the whole verse, but I want you to focus on part of it. And it came to pass. Those are the words I want you to focus on. In those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. The part that I want you to focus on is, and it came to pass. And it came to pass. Someday, <clears throat> this life will be over. There'll be no more pain. We've sung about it through the years. There'll be no more pain, no more death, no more tragedies, no more misunderstandings. You remember the song that says, uh, what heaven means to me. There'll be no more misunderstandings. If anybody ever had a misunderstanding with somebody? I mean, we, there'll be no more misunderstandings. Nobody will misunderstand anything anymore. No sickness, no disease. No more issues with the devil 
uh, irritating you, family members. Um, God's will, of course, I'm going to state this and put this in here. God's will is that we don't have that now because Jesus said, I came that you could have and enjoy your life now. But if for some reason you're not living in the abundance that he came for you to have, Jesus said, I came that you could have and enjoy your life to the abundance till it overflows. But if for some reason you're not having that, for some reason you don't reach everything that God wants you to have, you don't receive it all. We need to view everything in the light of eternity. What will this mean to me uh, 20 years from now? My daddy used to have a saying. I guess it was a, a southern saying. When something would happen or somebody would say something or do something, Sister Juanita, he said, 100 years from no, now, nobody will know the difference. You know, and people, uh, daddy lived his life that way. He's like, how is this going to uh, look at, at 100 years from now? Things that maybe have bothered you, uh, hurt feelings, different things that's taken place in your life. Will it matter a hundred years from now? See, we need to understand we're not going to always have this body. We're going to get a new body. Thank God. Amen. This body's going through a transformation. This going to it's more mortal bodies going to put on immortality. Glory to God. And we need to look at that. And uh, in this portion of Scripture in John 14, 1 and 2, I want you to see the progression what Jesus did here. John 14, 1 and 2. He said, it's possible, and we need to agree with the word, let not your heart be troubled. A lot of people say, uh, I can't help it. Jesus said you could. Let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. What was Jesus saying? You're going to use the faith that I've given you, and it is possible not to have a troubled heart if you walk by faith. Come on, walk by faith, not by sight, not by feeling, but by faith. And he's, then he went quickly, Sister Linda, over to, In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I'd go to prepare a place for you. Then he said, If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will receive you unto myself. Somebody say, Thank God. Thank God. So what Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. Use your faith that I've given you. So you don't go around in this world with a troubled heart. But then he said, Keep heaven in view. Hallelujah. This is not all there is to it. Keep heaven in view. And uh, we need to look at it uh, the way that the Word tells us to. People say, well, you know, I can't help but be upset about this. Well, there are a lot of things you can't help happening to you, but you do have a choice whether you're going to live troubled or not. Whether I'm going to, Jesus said, my peace, when you go back down in uh, John 14, he said, my peace I give unto you. So I'm got to think it. I've got his faith. I've got his peace. I've got his promise. Come on. Peace, faith, and promise. Somebody say, I've got it. Amen. I've got, it. I got love, joy, peace, goodness, meekness, faith, temperance. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I already have it. So it is possible if I believe what Jesus said. So I want us to look at 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. And when we have time, we probably will not have time to go through this this morning. Uh, if I do have time to cover a little bit, of, I will. All right. Paul is saying something through here that um, if, you, if you go to the 11th chapter, let me just give you the, uh, the reference so you can go there later. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 20, and then go to uh, verse 23 through 27, and you'll see the account that Paul gives of everything he had been through. And through everything he had been through, he had been beaten numerous times. There are all kind of stuff. He was left for dead. There are many people who believe he did die, and the disciples gathered around him, and he was raised. He was shipwrecked. He was in perils on the sea, perils in the city, perils, uh, in perils among my brethren. Um, he was beaten and robbed. Numerous things happened. He was in prison numerous times. Um, so when you look at that, the Scripture says, Paul referred to it this way. If you read 2 Corinthians 11, 20 through 27, then go back and look at this in view of what Paul said. It'll give you a better perspective. And he said, for our light affliction. If you read everything he had been through, you would not call it a light affliction. If you met somebody and they tell you, I've had a heart attack, I've had cancer, I've been six car wrecks, I've been devastated, I've been completely wiped out financially, my husband left me and my dog bit me three times last week. 
And I said, but you know what? Ain't, ain't nothing but nothing to it. It's, that's a lot of affliction. You're thinking, whoa. Right. You're calling that a lot of affliction. This is what Paul's saying. For our light affliction, which is but for what? A moment. Now, first of all, he was in prison for days and days and days. It couldn't have been a moment of time. But he's saying it is but for a moment. Uh, Brother Billy, what is he looking at? He's looking at it in light of eternity. He's looking at living here. Well, many people believe he ministered about 35 years of Paul's ministry, actual ministry. But it's been about 2,000 years since he went to be with the Lord. And how many of you know he's in the presence of God and God has given him ample compensation and will continue to for everything that happened to him in this life. So Paul is saying, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. My goodness. Light affliction. Glory to God. Which was not a light affliction, but what Paul did and what the scripture, we say Paul, we realize when Paul wrote this, he wrote it by inspiration of the Holy Ghost. All scriptures given by inspiration. People held the pen, but the Holy Ghost wrote this book. He looks past the carnal. You've got to look, and you and I have to look past the carnal. Uh, uh, he said, while we look not at the things which are seen, that's carnal, but at the things which are not seen, that's eternal. For the things which are seen are what? What you're going through right now is temporal. I assure you, you will go through it and it come to pass. What we need to do is let's don't get stuck in the now and in the carnal realm. The things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen, glory to God, they are eternal. Amen. They are eternal. That's they are the, the spiritual realm of God where faith and I mean the presence of God is. And Paul is talking about the presence of God in the eternal uh, realm, supernatural realm of God is far greater than anything he's going through in the carnal realm. That's something you and I need to do. Amen. He looked not at the things which are seen. The problem comes in when we look at the things which are seen. When we look at the finances. When we look at the sickness maybe we're going through. When we look at maybe what people are saying or doing. And we look at all the things that are seen. And then we start focusing on that rather than all the great things of God. One of the greatest benefits of praise and thanksgiving is it helps us stay focused on the most important things. How many of you know the carnal realm, the natural realm, is not the most important things? It's the supernatural realm of God, the things that are eternal. Somebody say, praise God. Praise God. Amen. Well, I received that. We've got to receive this this morning. It helps us stay focused on things that are more important. The things of God, Sister Becky, are more important than the temporal things. Okay, there's somebody said something to hurt my feelings. Uh, my kids don't respect me like they need to. They said some things to me. And we get so stuck on that and we talk about it. Well, this one said this and that hurt my feelings and I got offended about that. But look here, 20 years from now, that ain't going to make no difference to me. Come on. Uh, we need to look at it in light of, e uh, of eternity and realize that it doesn't make that big of a difference. Yeah. Only if you focus on it. David said, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. But when you get stuck there, and this is where uh, I guess the Lord is, is saying that we need to kind of blast ourselves and get unstuck this morning. And I want to make a note here on the area of praise. The devil cannot do anything in your life, are you listening, unless he can get you focused and get you into griping and complaining about your current circumstance. Say it again. The devil cannot do anything in your life. People say, oh, why the devil? I tell you what, he's faithful to show up. And the Lord spoke to me the other day and he said, people think the devil's more faithful than I am. What about me? <laughs> is God faithful? Hallelujah. Is his word faithful? The devil cannot do anything in your life unless he can get you to focus on something other than what the word says and get you into griping and complaining. And I wrote down in my notes in big letters, discontentment. 
discontentment. Look back. Uh, we won't go there in Scripture, but in Genesis. Look back in the beginning. Look back at Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. What was there to complain about? What, I mean, what was there going wrong? Uh, they didn't have disobedient children. They didn't have finances to be concerned about. They wasn't concerned about what they were going to eat. Everything was provided. They had no, there was nothing wrong. Nope, nobody's sick. All these things, everything was perfect and great. And there may have been, I heard one person say, they may have been 10,000 trees in the Garden of Eden. 10,000. Of those trees in the Garden of Eden, of those possible uh, 10,000, Brother Kenneth, the devil got them focused on one. So, 900... <laughs> Let's look at 999, whatever. Let's look at what it was, 10,000 and one the devil got them focused on. One they couldn't eat. Think about that. The devil will always point out the one thing that's wrong. He'll do that. He'll point it out. Go ahead and, and cook a nice meal, fix everything you can possibly do, and somebody will say something, well, this would be perfect if I had banana pudding. Right. This would be just great if, if this happened, if I had that. Uh, the one thing that wasn't exactly right. Uh, the devil will always point out the one thing. You can sing a song, and it can sound beautiful. I mean, you the presence of God is in the place or whatever, and the last note she held too long. You know, or, or, or she didn't finish that note out or whatever. Or Brother Jerry, everything played well, but that last note he hit on the piano right before the choir was over. Because you see what I'm saying. The devil will always point out the one thing that is wrong. The devil will never point out the good. He never said anything to Adam and Eve about, look at all the trees you can have. He never said anything about that. Only one. The devil will never point out the good. So look at his approach. What was his approach and how did he get them to focus on one thing? He omitted all the good and went to one thing, which really wasn't a bad thing, but you can't have that right there. So focus on that. So what did he do? He got them in discontentment. When you get in discontentment and you listen to me this morning, when you're in discontentment, your mouth starts and there's griping and complaining follows. Another thing is, if one person's in discontentment and griping and complaining, they're going to gripe and complain to other people about that one thing. You know, you've heard that song, well, that preacher didn't even shake my hand. <laughs> you know, they're going to gripe and complain about that one thing because discontented people like to be around other people that they can cause to be discontent. Because the one thing a discontented person does not like is a person that's content. Right. Because it shows them up. Well, isn't there anything wrong in your life? Don't you have? Isn't there anything wrong with Brother Jerry? Doesn't he ever do anything that irritates you? Let's focus on that. Uh, I've been married to Brother Jerry for 35 years. Yes, he's done some things to irritate me. And yes, I've done some things to irritate him. But one of the things is this. 95% of what goes on with him and my life as, a, as him being my mate is good. You understand? Not at least 95% is good. And you can look at something and say, well, that person, you know, what about this? What about that? Yeah, but look at all the good. Uh, this is what praise does. It helps you focus on what's right. If you're going to be happy, and who wants to be? Anybody in the house? And you want to find God's perfect will, here's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to, and I'm going to have to do, on purpose, Give thanks and praise to the Lord that things are as good as they are. Amen? Give thanks to the Lord. We live in a country with a lot of crazy things happen, but give praise and thanks that things are as good as they are. We're right here gathered together worshiping the Lord, right? Hey, that, that's, that's a positive. That's a good. Amen. And praise, what it does is it takes you 
from the negative realm and the carnal realm to the positive realm and the spiritual realm. Amen? How many of you want to go to a positive spiritual realm and don't want to stay in the negative? Uh, some people want to stay over that negative realm. Look, uh, don't stay over there because that is a breeding ground for the devil really to work when you get in negativity and get in discontentment. Uh, the scripture tells us that godliness with contentment is great gain. Not just a little bit, but great gain. Praise makes you focus on the answer and not the problem. Amen? Makes you focus on the answer and not the problem. When you gripe and complain, you're focused on the problem. Negative, you're not going to get anywhere. But when you praise, hallelujah, you focus on the answer. When you're giving God praise, He's the answer. Amen? You focus on your answer. So many times we want people to identify with us and, and the stuff we're going through. Uh, that what that phrase was, can you feel me or whatever. You know, and I, that, I want you to, under, to feel what I feel and understand what I understand. I said to uh, Sister Juanita one time, I said, don't give a microphone to a, a, a discontented person. Don't give a microphone to somebody who's negative. Don't give them a voice. Don't give them a platform. If you can't say something good, stay away from a microphone because people have enough. Uh, uh, discontentment and negativity in our world we don't we don't need any more of that amen so we need positive glory to God let's go to uh, Colossians chapter 2 right now verse 6 and 7 another thing that praise does is it makes your faith to abound and that's a good thing glory to God hallelujah amen Colossians 2 6 and 7 are you getting something that'll help you Amen. It said, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk ye in him. Rooted and build up in him and establish in the faith as you have been taught. Look at there. Abounding therefore. How do you abound in faith? With thanksgiving. With giving of thanks, with praise, you abound. It causes your faith to abound. Uh, it makes your faith arise on the inside of you. When you lift up your hands, it's amazing to me that when my hands go up, my heart goes up. Hallelujah. My outlook goes up. It makes uh, faith arise on the inside of me. And no matter how bad you think things are, and people think, well, you know, we've got it bad, the Apostle Paul had it worse. When you go back and read, no matter how bad you think things are, the Apostle Paul had it worse. And also, he lived um, under a government. He lived under Nero. And if you study some church history, you know that he was in leadership, and he was an egotistical lunatic. Okay? And he had Rome burned, and while it burned, he played a violin. city burning he's playing a violin and yes mass murder and he turned around and blamed it on christians even though he's the one that had it started he blamed it on christians and of course paul was a key figure there and paul was put in prison because of this so paul was in prison because of something nero did and christians were being blamed so Let's look at it right here. Let's look at things uh, to say, okay, as bad as things are, I don't have it that bad. Can we agree that we don't have it that bad? The Bible says, rejoiced in the Lord his God. And he wrote in Philippians 16 times in four chapters, rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. He was in prison when he was writing this, Brother Donald. And he was saying, rejoice in the Lord. Give praise. We have never had it as bad as Paul did. We have never had it like that. So we are to be with our hands raised, praising God, amen, and giving thanksgiving. Praise has such a powerful effect on us, but it also has effect on the devil. The Bible says that praise, Brother LJ, will steal the avenger. What that means is that it will stop the devil in his tracks of what he's trying to do to you. Literally stop the devil. So the Bible tells us that praise affects us. It lifts our heart up. It makes our faith abound. It makes faith arise inside of us. Faith, the Bible says uh, uh, that praise strengthens us because the joy of the Lord 
is our strength. Amen? Stops the devil, steals the avenger, and blesses God. No wonder Paul said, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Amen. Glory to God. Things are so important. If you're going through a bad time, you need to praise God. Wow, if you need to get past your feelings, I need to get past my feelings, and I need to praise God. People say, well, what have I got to praise God about? Well, are you, are you a Christian? Are you on your way to heaven? Amen. Glory to God. Do you have the love of God in your heart? Amen. Are you baptized with the Holy Spirit? Come on, lift up your hands and thank God. Amen. It will cause you to focus on God. And here's another plus. I like this, Sister Linda. We identify right here. It focuses uh, me. It helps me focus on God. It also torments the devil. And come on, anybody in the house, have you ever had any torment from the devil? Have you ever had sickness, disease, and problems and situations? Has the devil ever done anything to you? Has the devil, hasn't he done enough to you and your family? Has he done enough stealing and killing and destroying and upsetting and irritating? Come on, has he? Glory to God. Amen. Satan loves to see you down in the dumps. He loves it. He, I mean, he just sits back and smiles about that. He loves to see you down in the dumps. He loves to see you and me gripe and complain about how bad things are. Think about that. Do I really want to give him that much praise? Do I want to praise the devil? Do I want to complain and, and complain and to complain about everything is literally like whistling for the devil. Do I really want to do that? Do I really want him up in my stuff? Anybody sick and tired of the devil being in their life and upset and stuff? Well, what we need to do, the Bible says God inhabits the praises of his people. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And then David said, let God arise and his enemies will be scattered. Glory to God. When we lift up our hands and worship and praise God. Amen. Things happen. I mean, things, powerful things happen. Somebody say, praise God, I know that. Amen, amen, amen. Uh, he's the one. The devil is the one. If there's been any stealing in your life, it wasn't God. The devil stole from you. If there's been any stealing, he's tried to bring death, destruction in your life and the lives of your loved ones. Do I really want to give him any praise for that? Do I even want to give him a second thought on some things. If he says about certain things, what about this, what about that? Do I really want to give him a voice? Or do I want to say, shut up. You're not speaking into my life. Shut up. You're not stealing from me. You're not stealing my joy. You're not stealing my peace. You're not stealing anything from me. Shut up. There has to come a time, Brother Donald, that we have some John Wayne Christians. We got some uh, Matt Dillons running around here somewhere that when somebody runs their mouth, you know how the cowards do, they run their mouth until Matt Dillon shows up and he says, shut up. I love it. Glory to God, because that's the way we have to do the devil. We surrender to God, but we say, shut up to the devil. Hallelujah. Sister Linda, things will go so much better if we would just say, shut up. I'm not listening to you. Uh, I'm not listening to you say one thing about somebody I love. I'm not going to listen to you and God I love. You're not going to say anything negative about my Heavenly Father. Not one thing. When the devil will say, look, God's going to forget you about this. He's not going to provide for you. Shut up. God has never done anything but been my refuge, my help, my provision, my strength. God has always been there. Amen. So we need to we need to call the devil's bluff on some things. If he's trying to scare you about something, you need to scare him. People say, well, how am I going to scare the devil? Remind him of his future. He doesn't have a very bright one. Come on. The devil's future is not bright. I heard one preacher say, your future is so bright, you're going to need some sunglasses to see it. The devil, however, does not have a bright future. Mm, glory to God. Let's go to Acts 16. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God is so good. Good, 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 good. 
He is better than Sister Juanita's chocolate cake and pumpkin roll and all that thing. He's better than uh, Sister Linda's uh, collard greens. He's better than all this stuff. And he's better than, than John's crab boil and all this stuff. He's better than Sister Janice's blueberry cake. Amen. We need to understand that God is so good. He's better than Brother Donald's Brunswick stew. Come on. Do y'all believe that? Amen. I believe that. Lift up your hands. I believe that. Glory to God. I believe that. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Now, and in Acts 16, which we can't read the whole thing, we understand that Paul got put in prison because he delivered a woman, a damsel that had an a evil spirit, and she was following them around saying, listen, these men be good. You know, they be of God and all like that. So Paul cast the devil out of this woman, and the people that were making money from her got mad and threw him in jail. This is what she was saying. Real briefly, I'll go to verse, um, let's see. Let's try 14. I'll try not to read the whole thing at all. It's good, though. A certain woman uh, named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Tyre, which worshiped God, uh, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, and she attended unto the things that were spoken, un unto, spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, If we have uh, judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel, possessed with a spirit of divination, met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same, which was witchcraft, right? Right, fortune telling. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are servants of the Most High God, which show us the way of salvation. She was saying, These men are of the Most High God, but it was with the wrong spirit. And this did she many days, but Paul, being grieved in the spirit, turned and said uh, to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and it come out the same hour. And when her master saw that the hope of their gains were gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace and the rulers, and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city. He was doing good, wasn't he? But it got in trouble. And teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Roman. And the multitude <clears throat> rose up together against them. How many? Multitude. And the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them for casting a spirit out of someone. And when they had laid many stripes on them, this is really pertinent to this uh, uh, writing here in the story, Many stripes upon them, they cast them in prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, which meant the jailer could lose his life if he didn't. Who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made, and made their feet fast in the stocks. Now, one of the reasons that's so important in the stocks and fetters and all this and the cruelty that seemed there, we have to understand they're beat, so they can't even get in a comfortable position. They're tied. They can't... They're, they're, they're bleeding. They can't even get in a comfortable position. Made their feet fast in the stocks, and at midnight, Paul just complained and griped and bellyached. Is that what the Scripture said? <laughs> and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. And suddenly... There was a great earthquake, a very unusual earthquake, so that the foundation of the prison was shaken. Amen. And immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakening out of sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoner has fled. Because they knew they would kill him if he didn't kill himself. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, which means it was totally dark. Are we together on this? It was totally dark. And he called for a light and sprang in 
and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thine house, glory to God, can be saved. Amen. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord to all that were in the house and he took them the same hour of that night and washed their stripes and was baptized he and all his house. Glory to God. Glory to God. I want you to look at what happened when they praised God. I mean, in a rotten, terrible situation, they praised God. At midnight, with bound hand and foot in a dark dungeon cell, with stripes on their back, bleeding and hurting, they begin to praise God. Isn't it amazing that they praised God and didn't start to complain, well, I wonder why we're here. Well, we surely didn't deserve this. They started to praise God. And it's evident, Sister Juanita, when nobody left, that they were not praising God to get out of a bad situation. They were just praising God because God was worthy. Amen? They weren't just trying to get out. They weren't trying to just get me out of here, God. I, I, their, their prayer, Brother LJ, was not get me out of here. Get me out of here. I shouldn't be here. They was giving praise to the Lord. The Bible says they were. So what we see here, and this is one of the main points I want to get to in four minutes if I can. Unselfishness is such a godly thing. Paul and them was not trying to just get out of a bad situation. They were thinking about some other people. The jailer that was in there led him to the Lord, led his family to the Lord. Um, they were singing praise. And the Lord said to say this morning, the most grief that people face in their life is because of self-centeredness and because they're thinking about their self all the time. Prayer to God, amen, because He's good and His mercy endures forever. Glory to God. And the fact that He will never, never forsake us, amen, He will be with us when all others leave our side. He is faithful. Glory to God. Amen. Uh, the Lord brought this to me, and you might think this is strange. I'm bringing this out. This may be jump-starting into another teaching, but I wrote it down, and I feel like I want to say it. And it's a side note to some people, but I believe on point. Why people are angry at God and not the devil. I remember back when people were more angry at the devil and they were blessing God more. Are you listening? But people are angry at God because God brought this tragedy. God caused this, the acts of God, the hurricane, the tornadoes. Why people are angry at God and not the devil? The reason is, the answer is, they think that God could do something about their situation and just won't. That's why they're angry. Why didn't God do this? You could do something. God can do anything, can he? Well, technically, God can do anything, but God doesn't involve himself in everything. They think that all the situations are bad. What has to happen right here, we're talking about renewing our mind, and we have to think correctly. The people that think God can do something about their situation but just refusing not to, their thinking is wrong. You understand? Their thinking is wrong. And when we involve God, hallelujah, when we get to praising and worship and doing what God's telling us to do, then things change in our life. We need to renew our mind to this. God does not sanction, send, or allow all the things that happen in our life. When I got up this morning and say, well, I fell out the front door. Well, that'll teach me you not to be careful when I come out the front door. Or I talked about somebody and I fell down. I remember it yesterday. That's probably God getting me back. None of that. None of that is so. God, you know, God's not going to get you for things. People, and we said this before, and, and we, it would do good to repeat. If God wanted to get you, you'd be God. Because he's God, right? So uh, they're not thinking correctly. That's why we're here this morning. They need, and we need to praise God and resist the devil. If you got bad stuff happening, resist the devil with the word of God. The Bible says in Ephesians 6 that the word of God is the two-edged sword. God said it, you said it. That's one edge, two edge. Glory to God. A two-edged sword. 
Amen. And then do what God told them to do in Mark 11 and 23 and use their authority and speak to the mountain. Not talk to the mountain about God, but talk to the mountain and tell that mountain, get out of my way. Tell that sickness, tell that disease, tell that problem, tell that uh, uh, demonic. Uh, some people say, well, the devil tormented me all night. Well, I won't say shame on you, but it's not too smart to lay there and be tormented all night long with the devil. When you got a two-edged sword in your, that you can put in your mouth and say, get out of here. What are you doing talking to me? What are you doing coming in disrupting my sleep? We're going to say, well, the devil tormented me all night. Well, then who would be the dope in that? Glory to God to say, well, somebody just kept kicking me in the leg and I said nothing. Well, well, they, I thought they'd quit eventually. Come on, we've got to have a Walter Parrish mentality. If our sister Sherry ever listened to this, uh, the, the little boy that kept kicking him in the leg and kicking him in the leg and daddy said, are you going to put up with that? He said, he'll quit after a little bit. Come on, Daddy said he'd quit now if he was my youngin'. We need to understand some things and stop some things and speak to some things and use our authority because we do have authority in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Why would he give us his name if we had no intention of using it? If he said, you can say in the name of Jesus, I've given you my name, I've given you my power, I've given you my peace, I've given you my faith, I've given you my love. Now what are you going to do about it? Are you with me? Come on, gather your mind up this morning. Gather and gird up the loins of your mind. Hallelujah. What are you going to do about it? Are you going to continue to let the madness go? Are you going to do something about it and say no in Jesus' name? Amen. Amen. We have authority. Jesus said, behold, I give you authority. I give you power over all the power of the enemy. Did he say that? Did he mean that? Is it true? Glory to God. So we have authority. So we speak to the problem. Whether we're aware of it or not, if you don't speak to the problem, you are assisting the devil. Come on. You're assisting the devil. I don't want to assist him in anything. Glory to God. Worship and praise and thanksgiving is a powerful weapon. But here's what has to happen. It needs to come out of a pure heart and not just used as a tool to get out of a bad situation. Sometimes people like, they, you know, I'm in a bad situation, so I'm just going to praise God and praise God and praise God and maybe he'll get me out of this. That's the wrong mindset right there. When we look in the scripture, we know that. Amen? We have so much to praise God for. Wow. We've got so much to praise God for. I've got my right mind. Even if three or four people I know might disagree with me. But I got my right mind. <laughs> Glory to God. Glory to Amen. God. Come on. I got my right mind. Amen. I got plenty of food to eat. Got shelter. Amen. Glory to God. I'm married to a wonderful man most of the time. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. He's a great man. I just don't realize it all the time. We have so much to praise God for. And we need to find the good and praise the Lord. Because God inhabits our praise. Look at what happened when they praised God. The earthquake came. The prison was shaken. All the doors unlocked. All their chains come undone. Glory to God from prayer and praise. Mm -mm -mm. Praise causes our faith to abound. Amen, amen, amen. We do. We need such a, a, a change in our mind. Glory to God. Faith abounds when we praise the enemy, if you, I can't go to the scripture there, but look in Matthew uh, chapter 21 and Psalms 8. It does stop the, uh, the devil from doing stuff in your life and his tracks. It'll stop him dead in his tracks. It'll also bless the Lord. Amen. Come on, stand up today. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. 
God is a good God all the time. Amen, amen. Lift up your hands and just worship the Lord. God is so good. God, you're so good. Lord, we thank you, Lord. We're able to be here this morning. Lord, we're able to be in a place with your people, worshiping you, the power of the word, Lord. We have the presence of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we just give you praise and honor and glory. Lord, you're so good to us, Lord. We just thank you today. God, you've blessed us, Lord. You've blessed our going out and our coming in. God, you have touched our life and helped us, always willing to help us, God. And you've blessed us with all spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And Lord, we give you praise. We give you honor and thanks. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. God bless you today. We're going to take a quick break. Go into praise and worship. Amen.